in Roman numeral four, nesosilicates. Last lecture, we talked about olivine. We talked about zircon. And that brings us to where we are now, which is going to be capital D, garnet. And garnet, I want to treat garnet as a group rather than as a specific mineral because there are many different types of garnets that can be allowed through a solid solution. The general chemical formula is X3, Al2, Si3, O12. And what we're doing here is X is not a mineral on the periodic table. This is a place where we can substitute in a 2 plus cation. So I'm going to write here, this is one, a 2 plus cation can be put here. And it's things like iron could go there, magnesium, manganese. And these will be part of a solid solution that's going to control the appearance of the garnet. We'll go with Roman numeral 1, mineralogy. In general, all the garnets are pretty similar in a lot of ways. They have a hardness of about 7. They have a specific gravity of about 4. And they also all crystallize in the isometric system, and they tend to make forms that look like dodecahedrons. So we're going to go here, we're going to say isometric, and we're going to look for dodecahedrons. Now specifically, this is a dodecahedron comprised of right, 12 faces, but you can have more than 12 faces. I think, oh boy. This is like a trapezodeco, easy for me to say. Suffice it to say, there are other more complicated, but more golf ball-like type shapes that can occur in the isometric system with the garnets. Now in our classic view of garnets, this is what I want you to have in your mind, where we have a metamorphic rock. In this case, this looks like a biotite bearing schist with beautiful porphyroblasts, large outside crystals of dodecahedral red garnets. That's your classic view. We'll show you some other views um, that'll help you understand what other things garnet can look like. And in fact, we should we better probably start here with color. Any color is possible within the garnet group because each of these different cations, it can substitute into that X spot. And even later at a, at a higher level class, you're going to learn that this aluminum spot can actually have different things as well. But, so, but anyways, the different chemistry is going to control the different colors. And each of them have different names as well. This is a neat image that has made it onto the, uh, I guess you could say, kind of popular on the internet. And so I might as well show it here right now. And it summarizes this chart that's in the textbook. And so some of this stuff from this chart, I think it's worth just kind of writing down in your notes kind of quickly. And that is some of these names that I want you to know. I want you to know these four specific types of garnets. And there's the pyrope version. Where's pyrope right here? Okay, I'm going to go blue. So here's our pyrope on this cool internet graphic. And pyrope is a reddish purple. And so you can say purple, plus red would be the colors you expect for pyrope, and the cation is magnesium. This is a mineral that's coming from the Earth's mantle, most likely. Now, almondine is our iron. You can put that here, and it is red. Spessartine is manganese, and it is orange. And then grossular, this is yellow to green, mostly. And this is where we have calcium in that two spot. Okay, so I expect you to know those four end members of the solid solution inside of the garnet group. These out here, you don't need to know, but they're, they're including other complications where that aluminum is being replaced. But that's beyond the scope of this class. In terms of our geology, oh, let me put in one more picture before we do geology. In fact, we'll have this picture on the screen. There we go. Oh, this is good for recognition before we move on to geology. I just want to point out to you that it's pretty easy to identify that as a garnet because we see the dodecahedron and we see that red color. This one gets a little trickier. The dodecahedron is still probably going to be there if we were to allow that shape to fully form, but part of it's cut off. The color makes it tricky, so instead here we're trying to use that glassy to uh, adamantine luster and that crystal shape to make the identification. But this example of a grossular garnet or spessartine, depending on, we can't really tell, the color of it 
um, is either spessartine or grossular. This is even harder because what we have here are really nice dodecahedrons that are all intergrown with one another. And because they're intergrown and overlapping with one another, we don't see a perfect dodecahedron. We just see pieces of it. And this is something to train your eye about because this is something that would definitely be fair to show you on an exam for garnet, even though you don't see the dodecahedron specifically. Okay, so now let's move on to, to geology. The geology of garnet is anything. And maybe that's too hard of an answer to say, but it'll occur in igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, sedimentary rocks, and in the mantle. And there's different types in each of these. So in an igneous system, garnet will occur as an accessory mineral, soaking up weird things like manganese or iron. And so we can get something like almondine or spessartine as our types. In the metamorphic environment, metamorphic environment, we'll put a star because this is the like most classic type of mineral. But here, it's a rock forming mineral. And that just means that it is very important and it's abundant. And it's rock forming specifically in schists and in gneisses and in marbles. Other rock types too, but these are kind of the big ones where you'd always expect to be looking for garnets. Almondine is a good example of the type to be looking for here, or even grossular. Grossular is a good type too. In the mantle, garnet is also a rock forming mineral. You might not think of it as coming from there, but what ends up happening is that pyro garnets can be a very large component of peridotites. And then finally, in sedimentary systems, it will be detrital. And that's because it is both hard as a mineral, a seven, and heavy. So it has great survivability, and so it can be enriched in plaster deposits as a detrital mineral. And that is the end of garnet. Although it seems a shame because it's such an important mineral. It feels like we should talk about it more. But alas, we cannot, and we must move on to the next group. Let's see, which one was that? Was that D? I would, yeah, I think this one's E. This is a family of minerals called the aluminosilicates. Silicates. And the, what I mean by this, by the aluminosilicates, is basically we have a bunch of polymorphs. And the polymorphs all have the same chemical formula, but different atomic structures. And they are Al2SiO5. And there are three of these. And how do we put the, we should put the pictures in. We'll do it like this. We've got a mineral called kyanite. We've got a mineral called andalusite. Oh boy, can I fit them all in? And a mineral called sillimanite. And we'll say that those are all fit in. And underneath each one of these, we're going to put some names. So in your notes, what I recommend you do is you go kyanite. And in the middle of the page, put andalusite. And then over here, we're going to put sillimanite. And the way to recognize kyanite, well, this is like the mineralogy student's favorite mineral, nine times out of ten, because it's so beautiful, it's easy to identify. It ends up being in the triclinic system, and it makes these beautiful uh, blue and bladed crystals. There's interesting aspects of them that almost most students don't even bother learning because they don't need them to identify it. They tend to have these grooves in one way. There's a hardness of, of seven along the crystal and only five across the crystal. But it's an important component in diverse uh, metamorphic rocks. Now, andalusite and sillimanite are also important in metamorphic rocks. So when we get down to the geology, Metamorphic rocks is the answer for all of them. And it's going to be the difference in temperature and pressure of that metamorphic system that's going to allow for the different crystal structures to grow with the Al2SiO5 uh, chemical formula. So in andalusite, we get these prisms. And they end up being orthorhombic prisms. And there's something very characteristic about when you break the prism perpendicular to the long axis, to the C-axis, you tend to see this right here. If you look at that, 
there's this black cross that crosses the crystal. And if you look at every single one of these others, you see a similar black cross. So what we're going to often do is we're going to look for a cross composed of inclusions. I'll say this, composed of oriented inclusions. Things like graphite might be, have been incorporated within the crystal structure. And this, this um, cross is called chiastolite. Chiastolite. In your notes, I recommend you draw a orthorhombic crystal. So what, here's our crystal, and there it is, there's our prism. And what I want you to draw is a chiastolite cross going through that crystal to remind yourself of that texture that you could expect to find in andalusite. And then silimonite, oh boy, this is kind of a hard one to, to talk about in mineralogy class. It should form orthorhombic prisms like this one. This one's a little bit water-worn. At least at Baylor, I don't have any crystals even that good of silimonite. Instead, we get a variety of silimonite called fibrolite, which is comprised of like microscopic acicular crystals. And so all this white in here that's kind of aligned in this metamorphic rock, we actually would just see a bunch of, let's see, there's our rock. We just see a bunch of aligned needles. This is fibrolite. And so we're going to say aligned acicular needles at microscopic scale. It's a very important mineral, but one I just don't have good in my collection. And maybe a lot of other schools don't either. So those are our three different types. Now, what about our geology? The geology of all three of these is the same, at least at the starting level. Geology is aluminum-rich, metamorphic rocks. Specifically, schists are going to be the main rock type that are going to have them. But they're going to be different tectonic environments. And we need you to know what type of tectonic environments. Well, they're going to have different PT space. So what we're going to do, we're going to put in a phase diagram. And the phase diagram is in P T space, where we're going to have temperature here and pressure here, and there's phase boundaries within this graph. Each line separates out the different mineral stabilities, and a leucite is at lowest pressures and moderate temperatures, between like 200 and um, 800 degrees. Silimonite is a very hot variety of Al2SiO5, and then kyanite is the colder variety, but going up to high pressures. And so what, we're gonna, what I want you to know, later in petrology class, you're going to learn about it more. But when we think about this, kyanite and silimonite, these are in continent-continent collisions. Continent-continent collision, plate tectonics, big mountain building events. Mountain building. And and the leucite, this is in more a contact metamorphic environment. Contact meta environment where pressures never go very high, but temperatures can get elevated. Maybe it's an, also an environment with many magma chambers. We're not actually in a magma chamber, but there are magma chambers that increase the geothermal gradient. Well, you can read more about it in the textbook if you need a little more. It's an interesting story to learn. See you later.